Hi everyone, thank you for joining our July Florida Broker Roundtable meeting on how to secure and service listings, hosted by Robert Milligan. I would like to show everyone a new icon that we have on the AJI University dashboard. That is the AJI Systems. We've created this icon to make it easier for you to access the systems that we use here at AJI. Um, so in here, you can log into Skyslope directly just by clicking on this first drop down. You can log in or create an Express Docs account. Now this is where you can create marketing materials, direct mailers, flyers, postcards, business cards, pretty much you name it in this store. If you need to renew your license and you still need to complete some continuing education hours, we have partnered up with the CE shop to provide a discount on those CE credits for you. Um, so you can log into our portal directly here. And we have the link to log into your agent marketing account. Uh, if you do not have a login for agent marketing yet, please let us know and we can send that over to you. Um, but agent marketing is where you can create your property websites, your agent website, virtual tours. Uh, there are a ton of tools available in here for you. So um, we've created this icon to make it easier for you to gain access to all of these systems. Now with that being said, I would like to pass it over to Robert. Good afternoon, Robert. Good afternoon, Victoria, and good afternoon to everybody else that's joining us today. I am really happy to give what I hope is a helpful, informative presentation for you to advance your business and give better customer service. And um, we're talking specifically about listings and specifically about sellers today. So um, kind of the description of the webinar is basically that securing a listing is all about being confident in your marketing plan, your pricing, and your ability to represent and protect the interests of your customer. Uh, this webinar today will be for anybody who wants to gain more confidence in representing sellers and wants to better establish their value proposi proposition to their list side customers. So some of the things that we will be covering today will be how to position yourself as a professional before the appointment, how to prepare for the meeting and what you should bring, how to discuss price with the seller and encourage realistic pricing, how to manage the seller's expectations to avoid disappointment and resentment, We'll also talk about how to prepare a property for the market, how to negotiate on a behalf of a seller, and uh, we'll also talk about some legal strategies that I think are very important from the selling side of the equation and how and when it may be best to release a, a seller from the listing agreement. Sometimes we have situations that we need to um, politely excuse ourselves from from a business standpoint. So. Those are some of the things that we'll be covering today, and I do better whenever people ask questions. So hopefully this can be a bit interactive, and Victoria's here if you type in a question, or um, I think there's a way to raise your hand. But um, basically, you know, before the listing appointment, before anything, um, you know, there's a few ways that you can prospect for sellers. Of course, there are always uh, for sale by owner properties that do almost always eventually list. There are expired listings in your MLS system. There are withdrawn listings in your MLS system. And then, of course, um, farming is another technique that you can prospect for sellers. And farming is, is useful and effective, but it's probably the slowest and costliest way to generate listings. So as long as you're aware of that, it's, um, for that reason, my least favorite way. <laughs> but it's a good way to, um, you know, just keep your brand and your face in front of customers so that hopefully whenever they think of selling, you're the first person that comes to mind. So what I like to think of is that, you know, being a realtor, being in the real estate business, this is a profession and you are a professional, uh, very similar to being a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or somebody like that that you think of as a professional where, you know, generally people need an appointment for your time. Generally, a professional is very busy and, um, you know, ha has a schedule that sometimes is booked a few days in advance. And, you know, if you're further along in your sales career as a realtor, you do obviously want to be available for customers, but chances are you are actually very busy if you're doing this right. And so think of yourself as somebody that, um, you know, that, that people need to schedule some time with it. It's not just a knee-jerk reaction whenever somebody picks up the phone and calls you. And, you know, I think that it's actually oftentimes a mistake to be too available, especially whenever you're establishing um, boundaries for the relationship. So 
you know, one of the ways that, that I've done this is, you know, whenever in my mind the agent gets to probably more than about four or five million dollars a year in annual sales volume, mathematically it usually work, makes sense to hire an assistant and get some formal help to help you scale and get your business to the next level. For me, um, I did that years ago and it became very, it became better for me to have the customers hear from an assistant rather than myself, much the same way that you would um, schedule an appointment with the doctor or the dentist if you're, you know, calling in to schedule a teeth cleaning or whatever <laughs> that you're going to go do, chances are the dentist is not going to pick up the phone and not going to look up the calendar and, you know, send out the postcard reminder and all that kind of stuff. And you're not expecting that because you believe that you're hiring a professional, you know. So it's the same way, I think, that if you look for opportunities to leverage an assistant and, you know, have them reach out to confirm the appointment, have them maybe even at times when it's appropriate book the appointment, you know, if the seller reaches out directly, you can, um, you know, just, just figure out a way to formalize the process with your assistant so that, you know, you appear to be more of a professional and you don't absolutely have to have an assistant, but, you know, if you really want to scale your business and position yourself properly, I think that it is money w well worth spending. So something to think about. And, you know, you don't need an assistant, but you can certainly at least conduct yourself more professionally and, you know, establish the boundaries and the guidelines. I think that, you know, there are obviously a lot of agents that are willing to give just absolutely around the clock service. Um, years ago, I decided that I was not that agent. And I do have a, you know, system set up that, you know, cus customers can get service at additional hours. But for me, generally, um, people do not expect to be able to reach me late at night or, you know, um, don't expect like immediate responses on the weekend. And that's just something that's up to you to be creative and design your business however you see fit. But always think about being a professional, not appearing to be too eager to, you know, just change everything around and jump. So it might be counterintuitive advice, but it's worked for me. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, you got your appointment now and, you know, you're reaching out, you're prospecting, you've got expireds, withdrawns, whatever. And, you know, you, you have to be confident that you have a way to market their property that's more effective than any other realtor in town because, you know, truly it's your confidence that's going to be conveyed to a customer. And if it's an expired listing especially, this customer is probably going to be hearing from a lot of other realtors, you know, probably more than 30 or 40 realtors. And it's interesting because we run a local sales team in Sarasota. We've had some realtors on my, my local team call the same sellers and we're not successful in getting an appointment and then another agent that's on my team you know with a very similar um, dialogue with the seller was able to book the appointment so it's just interesting to know that you know some will some won't so what next um, another saying that I have is that you can't say the right thing to the wrong person and you can't say the wrong thing to the right person sometimes you just catch people at a, at a bad time you catch them at a good time you know, they don't like a, a female voice, they like a male voice or vice versa. I mean, you just never know. So you can't get too discouraged if you're not getting, you know, immediate results, but you must keep working and you must keep prospecting. And so, you know, I think it's important to just have a process that you're comfortable with and a dialogue that you're comfortable with because facts and figures are forgotten, but stories sell and stories get retold. So whenever you get somebody on the phone or you leave them a voicemail, you better have a good story that's going to make your voicemail or your your dialogue that you have with the seller stand out above and beyond um, the things that they're hearing from other realtors. So, you know, just give a little bit of forethought to that. I don't really believe in highly technical, you know, magic bullet scripts. I think that your story needs to be uniquely yours and it needs to be something that's in your own words and something you're comfortable with. But give that a little bit of forethought to book the meeting and then, you know, assuming you do have your meeting booked, um, you know, we got to prepare for the meeting. For me, I really enjoy having the day of the meeting have my assistant call the seller just to confirm the appointment. I think that it demonstrates that there's a lot of value to my time and it also um, demonstrates a level of professionalism that possibly could be um, something that exceeds the other agents that they may be meeting with. So I think that that's a really important step. And then we all have different styles. We do have a simple one-page listing like tear sheet basically that, that has some bullet points that, you know, demonstrates to a seller how we're going to market the property, how we negotiate on their behalf, um, some facts about Alice and James and about our team. And um, in, in Florida and in our local market, this is something that I think is really great for you as realtors to know and, and it helps encourage your confidence is that in our local Gulf Coast market, we're the second largest Gulf Coast-based brokerage, Alice and James Estates and Homes. 
with um, billions of dollars of annual sales volume. There's only one other company that's larger than we are that's actually based on the Gulf Coast. So, you know, again, that's something to um, tout as a, as a great benefit to a seller that, you know, we are, for the most part, a family-owned and operated company. So we have all of the great advantages of being a smaller company where, you know, it's, it's a family-based company, but we have billions of dollars in annual sales volume. Therefore, you know, we have all the advantages of a larger broker as well. So, you know, get all of your, your facts and figures down so that if that's useful, it's there, but don't rely on it too terribly much. And I go very off script whenever I, I walk into a listing presentation because I feel like agents that come in with a formal presentation that's long, that's, you know, loaded with all kinds of facts and figures, you know, because really sellers initially, they may eventually care, but initially they don't care about you. <laughs> they don't care about the company that you work for. All they care, and, and they don't want to list their house. All they want to do is sell the house. And so if you're authentic with them from the very beginning and just convey a genuine interest in learning about them, learning about their situation, and figuring out why they want to sell their house, you know, that's going to be what's most important to the seller at first. All they want to know is that you're a normal, compassionate person that they can connect with that cares about them and their needs. They don't care about you and your needs. They don't care about how much your broker's done in past volume and all the statistics and all that kind of stuff. They just care that you're a person that's really genuinely interested in helping them. So always keep that in mind because I think, you know, having too stuffy, too rigid, too long of a formal listing presentation is problematic and there are many listing presentations that I go through the whole presentation, so to speak, without actually even pulling it out. I might just like, you know, use it, just leave it with them at the very end and not actually, you know, reference it at all during our discussion because, so the way, the way it works for me typically, I spend a lot of time walking around the house and learning about the seller before we even sit down. And sometimes we have sellers that, you know, everybody, every seller's got a different um, objective and sometimes, you know, they just start showing us around the house and that happens very organically. Other times we meet sellers that, you know, they just want to march us like straight to the kitchen table and start talking business and start asking us how much, you know, how much our commission rate is that we charge and, you know, just going right to business. And I think that um, that I, I avoid that at all costs whenever a seller wants to just like sit down immediately and start talking business. I just say, well, that, you know, that, that's great. We'll get to all that. But, you know, for me, I really need to see your house and, and just get to know a little bit about what the job entails and what your objectives are so that I can, you know, know how I can best help you and best meet all of your needs. So, you know, usually I can avoid sitting down at the kitchen table right away and walk all through the house and just look for clues whenever you're walking through the house. Look for, you know, pictures on the wall of if interests like golfing or boating or, you know, whatever interests that you see, um, you know, just start make conversation that breaks the ice a little bit about, you know, the decor if you like it, be complimentary, you know, ask who picked out the pillows, I don't know, whatever, just, you know, make conversation to start connecting with the seller and start creating a relationship. And then eventually, you know, find out why it is that they're selling, what their objectives are. Do they want to be closer to their kids that just had a baby that live up north? Or do they, you know, um, do they want to downsize and, and get into a smaller home to get ready for retirement? Or do they want to change lifestyles to go from a boating lifestyle on the water to a golf course lifestyle in the same city or a different city or whatever it is, find out what it is, why they're moving because that's going to be really important for you to talk about throughout the entire presentation. And so, you know, for me, I wouldn't say that my presentation is much of a presentation at all. It's more of just a discussion. And then, you know, I've got my little simple one page thing that we can pull out if somebody wants something that is a little bit more formal. But generally, I try to avoid the formal. And, you know, one thing that I am really confident about and this whole key of this whole presentation today, this webinar, is that you must be confident that you can do the very best job of any other realtor in town because people can detect that confidence and if you don't have that um, you just need to work on making yourself better and getting yourself in a better position with the marketing that you do have that you really do believe that you're going to do the best job and that you know it's not just marketing but also understanding the contract that way that you know that there's no other realtor in town that's going to be able to protect them as a seller better than you can to be able to interpret the contract and advise them and so you know you just got to really know your craft and whenever you perfect your craft and know your craft you're going to feel like you know if they're in anybody else's hands other than than yours you know that the, they're going to have an inferior experience and so you know over a lot of time and a lot of practice you know fortunately i've been able to attain that where i really do believe there's not another realtor in town that can give them a better experience than i can and, um, you know, you need to be able to have that same level of confidence. And, and Allison James is a great broker vehicle to instill that confidence in you. 
<clears throat> so preparing for the meeting, what to bring. Um, the one thing I do bring is my laptop. I think if you're comfortable with technology, I think that that helps. And I, I think that people enjoy looking at a computer screen more than papers, to be honest. Sometimes whenever I, you know, when we're having a discussion, I'm learning all about their needs and, and maybe about 30, 45 minutes into the discussion, then I'll bring out the laptop. I think it's a mistake to go straight to it. But, you know, on my laptop, some of the things that I have is uh, we leverage highly a uh, HD, really, really classy video for the way that we market properties, especially using, using social media. That's something that's very unique to us that we've developed um, internally with our team. So, um, you know, I, I, on my laptop, start talking about the way that we leverage social media, the way that we create an HD video for the property that's really fast and fresh and hip and people enjoy seeing it, they enjoy sharing it. Uh, I start to tell them a little bit about the ways that we can, you know, tailor a specific audience that we advertise to through Facebook and, and um, Instagram, how we can, you know, literally, if it's a waterfront property, we can literally um, narrow the audience down to people with a certain net worth and excess of X number of dollars that have displayed an interest in voting. I mean, you can get highly, highly specific who sees the ads that you promote on social media. And so these are things that, that sellers enjoy knowing and they enjoy seeing the marketing, which, you know, again, to the confidence level, I'm very confident there's no other luxury broker in my town that produces a video that looks better than ours. I think ours are far superior. So, you know, again, it comes back to confidence, but, you know, people enjoy looking at the computer screen. I also will go over the contract, the listing contract with them, and this is, you know, something that uh, I encourage you to practice at and to get comfortable with. It's worked very, very well for me to go over the listing agreement with them on my computer as it's already loaded into DocuSign. And it helps the conversation just unfold in a natural way um, where I have the contract loaded, I'm going over through it line by line, I have a good sized computer screen that makes everything very legible, very easy to see, and, and I'm literally, they're watching me, and, and it just kind of brings people in and, and helps connect all the dots with the conversation. They're watching me drag and drop the little initial tabs and the little signature tabs onto the listing agreement as I'm explaining it to them. So it's just kind of making a natural progression that, you know, here's, you know, how we're going to market the property and here's what we need to do in order to begin this process. And then as soon as we can, you know, get this process started, then we can schedule our uh, videographer and photographer and, and get the property ready for market. And so it just kind of creates like a logical um, process for the seller to watch. And then usually whenever we're talking about the listing agreement, they're watching me dragging in the initial tabs and the signature tabs, you know, then I say, well, we can, you know, I can email this to you and you can log in and sign it on my computer. Or if you have your cell phone, you can just click it right on your cell phone so that we can begin. Just makes it, you know, easy to um, ask for the next logical step versus having to come to kind of an awkward conclusion at the end where, you know, it's basically like a yes, no, like, are you ready to list? Yes or no? You know, I mean, that that's not usually a really good question or a good way to end the meeting. So, so this just kind of creates a little bit more of a seamless transition into like, okay, well, here's what we got to do. And, you know, as we're going through the listing agreement, we're now, we're also obviously talking about price. And so the way that I discuss price, there's a lot of good ways to do this. And, you know, this is where I think it's important to put your business brain on versus, you know, your realtor brain. Because um, I think sometimes that the way realtors are brought into the business, they have to take, you know, do a lot of studying, a lot of things that they just have to remember that don't always, are not applicable to the business, don't always make sense. And so, you know, realtors sometimes when they're brand new in the business, they start thinking that they are there to service every desire of everybody that they come into contact with in terms of selling the house. And, you know, you, I think you have to use your business brain and be strong. And again, it comes down to confidence, especially when talking about the price that, you know, we all the time sometimes have customers that want to list their house 20, 30, 40% over where the market is at for that house. And in my experience, you know, you have to be strong here and just inform them that, you know, while I appreciate the fact that you need this amount of proceeds to accomplish X, because usually the sellers that, you know, they want to list their house for more than it's worth, usually they're doing that because they tell me, well, I need, you know, $100,000 in, you know, my pocket to go do X. And, you know, and, and it's some arbitrary figure that they need for whatever they want to do. But, you know, that figure they need has absolutely nothing to do with where the market is at. So I, I you know, you, you have to inform them that, you know, I appreciate that you need to have this amount of money to do whatever the next step is for you. 
but the reality is is that the market is speaking otherwise and that you know here are some other comparable properties that are suggesting that this may, number may not be feasible you know what what would it be like for you if we ended up having to sell closer to x and you know just start like asking them questions about you know what kind of compromise they could make or would be willing to make or whatever and in my experience when i push back a little bit on price because everybody you know wants to start high and a lot of inexperienced realtors will accept overpriced listings and i'm never upset whenever we lose a listing to somebody to a newer realtor that's that's willing to overprice it because you know you can keep these people in your database you can set up MLS notices that whenever the property is withdrawn or expired down the road that you can get an instant email notification from the MLS to say like, you know, hey, that person that I spoke to three months ago or six months ago, the property just expired, they overlisted it, I suggested they listed it at X. And, you know, usually, and I've done this many, many times, I'll call the seller back after it expires and they say, yeah, you know what, you were right, I should have listed with you from the beginning and they list with me and sometimes they list at even a better price than whatever I suggested with them to list at in the first place. So, um, so keep those people in your database, but when, you, when you're confident about the price and you push back a little bit, usually sellers know that they're pushing it and, and they're willing to become more realistic. So I think that it's important to use your business brain to say, you know, what probability am I going to have of generating revenue from this situation? Because every customer that you have, listing customers are going to take time, energy, and resources away from you in some capacity. You know, you're going to have hard costs associated with marketing, and your time is valuable. You know, if you believe, based on your sales volume activity, maybe, you know, if you're during your eight-hour day, five days a week, however you want to quantify it, I mean, you may be worth three, four, five hundred dollars an hour you know, why would you take a listing that's 40% over the market price and, you know, have very, very, very little probability of generating any revenue from the situation and perhaps, you know, working with a difficult person who doesn't, you know, help you experience any joy or happiness in your life. So, you know, rather than worrying so much as a newer realtor that, you know, I'm here to serve customers and I need, you know, and, and I'm, you know, the, the, tail that's getting wagged by the dog. It's kind of the other way around when you go back to the first point that you have to position yourself as a professional before the appointment. You know, if you're the professional, they're coming to you for as a trusted advisor and you need to be the dog wagging the tail, not the other way around for the lack of a better ex excuse. And, you know, sometimes um, one analogy that I bring up in discussion with the seller, you know, if I feel like I have to push really hard and I'm trying to justify why, is that I explain all the time that, you know, people hire personal trainers at a gym because they want to have a trusted advisor who is going to encourage them to experience, to push a little bit harder and experience a little bit more pain than they would, you know, subject themselves to on an individual basis for a good intended result, a good outcome. And so that, that's exactly what I'm here for as a trusted advisor and as a professional. You know, I know it's a little bit painful for you to hear that we have to list the price, you know, list the house at X, but I'm here to coach you through this process to help you get the intended result, which is to get, you know, X number of dollars so that you can get back to your kids that just had a baby up north or whatever reason that they told me. Because, you know, unfortunately, I, and I'll just tell them, you know, I understand that you want to list at X, but you know, the probability of you getting what you want is extremely low and me making any money is extremely low and it's just not going to serve any of us to, you know, not be realistic about this right now. People generally appreciate you being honest with them rather than just telling them what they want to hear because you're anxious to get your sign in somebody's yard. So that would be, um, for me, some of the ways that I encourage, you know, dealing with price, talking about price and um, letting them know that you're there to maybe help them withstand a little bit of extra pain, but in the end, they're going to get with the result that they want, just like a trainer at the gym. So, you know, that said, you know, next thing I, I think is really important is how to manage the seller's expectations to avoid disappointment and resentment. And, and this is a very, very important point, and I chose the words disappointment and resentment um, very intentionally because it's easy for sellers to have an idea of what you're supposed to do, and if you don't, really articulate exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it and how often you're doing it and um, you know all the finer points of those things they can start to feel disappointed and resented that you know you're not worth what they're paying you you're not around when they need you they don't know what's going on they're filled with questions and so I think that you know part of the battle is just having a lot of dialogue with your sellers I see especially newer realtors make the mistake of listing a property and they feel like 
you know, maybe if nothing super remarkable has happened this week that they don't need to touch base with their seller and, you know, just let them know that nothing remarkable has happened this week. I think that that's a giant mistake to just let, you know, like a week go by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by without, you know, having a lot of discussions with your seller. I mean, treat it like a relationship that, you know, this is somebody that's important to you and this is somebody that's going to refer other uh, friends, family uh, contacts that they have to you. And, you know, every few days, just call them to let them know that like, hey, we're, you know, we're hustling as hard as we can. We're promoting it online as much as we can. Don't have anything super exciting to report right now, but just want you to know that we're here. Want you to know that um, if you have any questions, we're, we're here to help. Just let us know. And, you know, and customers appreciate that so much. I can't tell you how much customers appreciate that versus, you know, just letting weeks go by and not hearing from you because then they're going to start, you know, their imagination's going to kick in. And even though you're doing as much as you maybe can do in the background, you know, don't assume that they know that. Let them know uh, um, all through every step what to expect, what to expect with your marketing, what to expect. I even let, real, let the customers know that whenever other realtors show the house from, you know, other random brokerages, we can't be there all the time. Sometimes uh, realtors will turn the AC down and leave it there. Sometimes they might leave lights on. Um, you know, very not likely, but you know, feasibly a realtor could leave a door unlocked. You know, and, and we put specific instructions for realtors in the MLS to make sure that they have good etiquette. But sometimes realtors don't have good etiquette. You know, I, I talk about all of these things in advance so that you know, whenever the seller comes home sometime, you know, after a showing and they find that like lights are left on or somebody cranked their AC down to 60 degrees and left it there, you know, I, I don't want them to just, you know, flip out like, you know, what in the world's going on here? This process is terrible because I, all that anger will end up being misdirected to you. Like there was something that you should have done to help them avoid, you know, whatever situation that they're upset about. So I, I think it's just good to be as realistic as possible to let sellers know that, you know, there's going to be some challenges that we have to overcome here. And, you know, in a perfect world, some of these things wouldn't happen. But, you know, that's what I'm here for is I, you know, I see all these challenges, I anticipate them before they happen. And I want you to, you know, understand that you need to put all your valuables away, that things can disappear from a house during showing that, um, you know, stuff happens. So, um, you know, I think it's just important to let them know how you're going to market it, when they're going to see it, the timeline of it, just have, uh, like, what, will probably feel to you like a lot of redundant conversation with them, but it's not going to be redundant to your customer, I promise you. We just, we reiterate over and over again, like, well, here's what we're doing today. Here's what's going to happen next. You know, when an offer comes in, we'll do this. Um, you know, just have a very over-communicative relationship unless you're specifically told not to, which, you know, 90% of our customers very much appreciate an over-communicative relationship. So, manage their expectations they'll be happy with that and then getting the property ready for marketing is our next little bullet point here I mean um, have just suggest whatever is necessary whether it needs staged whether it needs cleaned whether you know the the lawn needs attain uh, attend you know um, uh, some attention um, you know have a process for the right photography if you're going to do video have a process set for that and just make sure that, the, again, the expectations are set. You know, make sure that the seller knows, like, you know, we have photographer coming on X date. You know, make sure that you have no dishes in the sink, that there's nothing left on your kitchen countertops, that, you know, no beds are unmade. Make sure all the lights in the home are on so it saves the photographer time to run around and, you know, turn on all the lights. Just do everything you can to position the property in a best light and have all of the third-party resources available to them. Um, so that it's it's very easy for them to make choices and decisions. I mean, we obviously hire the photographer and videographer on ourselves for our, for ourselves, but other services such as maybe a cleaner or a stager or you know different services that you may connect the seller to directly. You know, have a few options for them so that they can interview a couple third parties and um, and just have everything be as seamless for them as possible. So next, I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, how to negotiate on behalf of a seller. You know, this is where I think that, you know, our value is really justified because here's where we can actually create a lot of additional revenue for a seller and we can also create a um, lot of, uh, avoid a lot of pitfalls, I should say. So um, when you're negotiating on behalf of the seller, I mean, always put yourself in their shoes and always, you know, think of all the ways that that, that seller could be left vulnerable and this is going to be dependent on their situation. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, in our area of Florida, it's always negotiable who pays for title, 
it's negotiable in advance if there will be any seller, um, um, if there's going to be any uh, need for the seller to participate in any repairs or if it's an as-is contract or what the repair limit's going to be, um, when the seller has to move, when the contingency periods expire, and just, you know, a quick example of some ways that you can look out for the seller is going to be like, for instance, um, I see all the time offers are submitted on our listings where the mortgage, the finance contingency, expires on the same date as the closing date. And for me, fundamentally, I would not, as a personal seller, if I were selling and moving from my own home, I would not be comfortable with the buyer being able to back out of the house based on the financing contingency without having any skin in the game or any, you know, recourse that's available for the seller up until the moment of closing, you know, because as a seller, think about they are probably going to incur some costs and aggravations associated with moving. Maybe they're moving to a rental, so they're going to have a first, last, and security deposit. They're going to probably pay for a mover. You know, so they're, they're going to have thousands and thousands of dollars, or maybe they're buying another property that they're moving directly into. They're going to have thousands of dollars at stake all for, this, for the buyer to be able, if the finance contingency expires the same day as closing, um, they're going to incur thousands of dollars worth of losses for the buyer to just say, sorry, we couldn't get funding, you know, 15 minutes before closing. And then, you know, the seller is out of the house. Now it's not staged. Now it doesn't show as well. Um, vacant houses usually get less money than, than furnished houses on the market. So, you know, now the seller is in a really crummy position. And that's something that could have been avoided had you negotiated better on their behalf. And so, you know, what I, what I do is set the, if, if the, buyer feels strongly that they must have, based on their lender's coaching, they must have 60 days of finance contingency, whatever. You know, I feel like 45 days is ample, but if they say they must have 60, I would make the closing, extend the closing date to at least 15 days after the finance contingency expires. That way, um, the buyer's escrow deposit becomes firm, as we call it, whenever it's no longer um, refundable to them. For at least two weeks that way the seller has some time to figure out like am i moving am i not moving you know and and if i do move and this and the buyer backs out i feel secure that at least i have this ten thousand or twenty thousand or whatever the escrow deposit is as recourse that you know if i if i move out and lose my first last and security deposit and move back into my house or you know whatever the damage is whatever the case is the seller is going to have some assurances that um that they can you know be made whole again based on the buyer's non-performance Another thing that's really important right now is um, hurricane season going on, and um, we do have a lot of insurance-related issues with hurricanes. A lot of times insurance companies have a moratorium on uh, issuing new binders on policies, and there is language in the FAR bar contract, which is the one that I recommend most highly for basically every market that we have in Florida. And, uh, and we actually now have an in-house insurance uh, solution, which um, is XQuote that is a great um, place for resource for you if you have any insurance related questions and, um, and, and we would love to quote all of your insurance needs if possible but um, it's insurance is a big part of the closing process and if you know there's a hurricane that's named in the Gulf or around the state of Florida and, it, and your buyer is now no longer able to get coverage it's going to delay the seller's closing so that time period could affect you know, a lot of stuff if they need their money to buy another house, if, you know, and, and something that could even actually be um, worse is if they are buying another house, you know, and maybe it's in another state that's not affected by the named storm in the Gulf, then their contract could, they could actually be out of contract by default if they're, they need the proceeds from their first sale to, to close on the second sale that they're purchasing you know, they could go out of contract and potentially have their escrow money at risk because there's no language specifically for that in the FAR bar contract. So, you know, these are important things that need thought through in advance. So all I say is to just read your contract forwards and backwards, know it like the back of your hand because that's where I think a lot of value is created as a realtor. And that's where a lot of your confidence comes from that you know that you're going to be able to do a good job for them and make sure that they're not vulnerable. So, um, you know, those are just some examples. There's a bunch of examples, and, uh, but just put yourself in the seller's shoes, pick the contract apart, and just make sure that you make, you know, that you give them enough, as much security as you possibly can so they're not vulnerable to anything more than they absolutely have to be. Make sure they understand all of those risks. So, you know, there are times also where a seller sometimes needs to be released from a listing agreement. And, you know, I've been a broker, this is my 16th year as a realtor, I think it's about 11 years now that I've been a broker with, with hundreds of agents at any given time. 
And, um, you know, general, I've been able to luckily avoid being in any lawsuits. Um, I've been able to, be, you know, basically serve a customer's needs with, without getting litigious at all. And, you know, there's, there's sometimes just times that a seller needs out legitimately for maybe a health reason or they just completely have a change of plans or whatever. The listing agreement automatically has built into it that the seller is going to be liable for any hard costs that you can produce receipts for directly associated with marketing the property. I personally choose to not charge a, a listing cancellation fee in addition to that. And, you know, there are times that that may change. It's always subject to change depending on the nature of, um, you know, the, what the seller is intending to do. And if they're asking me to do an awful lot, spend an awful lot, that might not be the case. But generally speaking, I don't charge a listing cancellation fee in addition to um, the hard costs associated with marketing the property. There are times that um, a seller is just not getting along with a particular agent and they might need reassigned to somebody. You know, whatever the case is, in most of your markets, in my market, this is a, even though Sarasota is, is got a lot of, you know, bigger amenities, it's still a relatively small town. I just feel like karma is something that you shouldn't mess with. I generally treat people really well and um, excuse myself from a listing whenever, whenever necessary. And, and, you know, there are times that you do want to stand up for yourself and, you know, not let a, a seller out of agreement if they may be having another buyer lined up that they met, you know, during your marketing period or, you know, there are times that sellers try to take advantage of realtors. You know, I'm, I'm not, not advocating that, that you'd be a pushover whenever somebody's trying to take advantage of you, but if a seller does have legitimate reason that they need out. Or the other thing that um, I would recommend is that if the seller is just not making you happy <laughs> and you guys just aren't a good fit for each other and, you know, like any business, this is not unique to real estate. This is entrepreneurial across the board. Usually 90% of your problems are going to come from 10% or less of your customers. And so if you have one of those sellers that is just requiring a lot of time, energy, and attention, a lot of which is negative, and it's just making you an unhappy person, you know, that might be a key indicator that you might be better off with that listing to go, you know, redirect all that time and energy to, to go find somebody else that would more appreciate your help. So, you know, keep that in mind as you go along building your business. I think the key point there is that, you know, just treat it like a business, put your business brain on. Just because you're a realtor doesn't mean you have to do everything that everybody asks you to do, which, you know, is what I initially thought when I got into this business as a very young man. You know, I just didn't have a lot of entrepreneurial experience yet. And when I first got licensed, I just thought I was there to do whatever anybody told me to do because they're the customer and you know, whatever, but that's not the case. Put your business brain on, create good relationships with people, um, create a good reputation for yourself over time, and I think you'll win a lot of listings, and, and really the name of the game to this business is if you want to scale your business, you want to get your business to the next level, you do have to have confidence to take listings, because um, listings will create a lot of organic buyers. I think that you know, you should try to have about 10 active listings or more at any given time, and then you'll never need to pay for another buyer. You'll have plenty of organic buyers contacting you, and, um, and you can leverage your time more. Listings generally take less time to service than buyers do because in our market, the, the market is still kind of a seller's market. It's in transition right now, but good properties sell very quickly, and if you're working with a few buyers that, you know, see a new property that just hit the market, you have to stop everything that you're doing, run, show them the house, maybe in the evening, maybe on the weekend, um, in order for them to have a fair chance of getting that house. And so, you know, whereas buyer, or sellers, rather, a seller, you can scale your time better, you can work on it during more manageable hours, during the normal work week, you can strategize, you can market, um, all in your own time, and, um, and, and you can leverage um, your, your energy and your, your number of transactions a lot better that way. So these are just some things that I wanted to share with everybody, and like I said, I would love to take questions. I do better with questions sometimes, and we can do this all together. You can call me anytime. I'm happy to offer broker support, but Victoria, that's the end of my presentation, and if anybody has questions, I'd love to, love to help out. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing, Robert. Those were some great points for, for everyone to remember. Um, we do have a question here, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type those into the questions box on your GoToWebinar panel. Um, the first question here, in regards to the listing video that you mentioned, Robert, are you using the video produced via agent marketing or something else? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that the agent marketing videos are great for our intents and purposes because we just have scaled a little bit larger. It, in our personal sales team, we actually hired on our payroll somebody that purely focuses on our marketing that does all of our photography, video, video editing, and manages our social media accounts. So that's a full-time position that we've actually hired independently for my own sales team. And I know that's not necessarily feasible for everybody to do right off the bat, but that's something that eventually you could, you know, scale to. But, you know, the agent marketing uh, .com video I think is perfectly great. You know, the main thing is, is that video is really important because it plays well on social media. And I think it's an important part of the process to express to sellers that, you know, you're, you are going to leverage the power of, of social media. I mean, it's, you know, Facebook is, is, is a, a party that I think, is it 2 billion people now or on Facebook or somewhere? It, I mean, it's like, it's bigger than like the second biggest country or something ridiculous. So that, so that's a place that you want your listing <laughs> to be promoted. So I um, hope that answers your question. It doesn't matter so much who or how the video, uh, if you want to see examples of some of the stuff that we're producing, our Facebook page for our local team is the Preferred Shore Group of Alice and James on Facebook. So if you um, type in preferred shore group of Alice and James, that's how we denote our local team. And um, you can see some great examples of videos we produce in house there. Perfect. Um, and for everyone, Agent Marketing does have a brand new HD listing presentation that is a video. Um, and of course, Agent Marketing is provided to you at no cost. So um, that's always an option if you would like to create your listing presentation video in there as well. Um, Absolutely. Another question here, Robert, are you utilizing a drone? We do utilize a drone in-house and it's, you know, through our marketing department. We are, um, you know, registered. We were careful about all the rules associated with drones. I know that there's, you know, still a lot of stuff going on with that, but yes, we do, we do use a drone. Perfect. And I think that is it for the questions today. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you, Robert. That was a great broker round table as usual. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and we hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.